My name is Medina. I'm Dr. Gavin Jell's PhD student. I will talk about nanoparticle characterization techniques. I'm going to take you through a journey from synthesis of nanoparticles to in vitro interactions of nanoparticles. And along the way, at each stage, I will explain what type of characterization techniques you could use. So let's begin with uh, nanoparticle surface characterization. What I mean by that is looking at the surface curvature, topography, shape, surface properties of your nanoparticles, diameter, surface charge, composition, or the porosity of your nanoparticles. So there are loads of methods that you could use to characterize your surface um, properties. Transmission electron microscopy TEM is widely used to look at the morphology of nanoparticles. It can tell us about size, shape, aggregation, or surface functionalization of your nanoparticles. Sometimes if you know the amount of uh, fluid you added to your um, copper grid, you can also calculate the concentration of your um, nanoparticles. I work with gold nanoparticles and they are uh, electron dense, so TEM is a great method to visualize them. Um, I used to, I used TM for size um, distribution analysis for the core size of nanoparticles. Scanning electron microscopy SEM is also used for size, shape, and aggregation analysis of your nanoparticles. As you can see from the results, SEM shows more 3D. Uh, view of your particles compared to TEM. Ultraviolet visible spectroscopy UVVs can tell you about the size, shape, concentration, aggregation, stability, surface functionalization, or nanoparticle protein interactions. The UV, UVVs is a great method to analyze nanoparticles. Absorbance can tell you about the concentration of your nanoparticles. Um, the number of peaks can tell you about the shape of your nanoparticles. So, For example, if you have a nanosphere, you will have one ASPR peak. If you have a nanoroid, you will have two um, ASPR peaks. Um, one for the width of your rod and one for the length of your rod. It can also tell you about the size. So if you taking into account the wavelengths where the that ASPR peak locates. It, it can tell you about surface functionalization. Um, for example, if you have pegylated your nanoparticle, you can compare it with non-pegylated and see if your process has been successful or not. Also, it can tell you about nanoparticle protein inter interactions. Energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy EDX um, is used for nanoparticle elemental composition analysis. Atomic force microscopy AFM has a fine tip as it touches your nanomaterial. It will tell you about the stiffness of your material and the topography of your material. Contact angle is used for the hydrophobicity analysis of nanoparticles or nanomaterials. So if, if you place your sample on the surface of that machine, there's a needle that you can add water from. And once the water touches the surface of your sample, you can measure the contact angle between your sample and the water. If that angle is more than 90 degrees, that means your sample is hydrophobic. But if the, it's less than 90 degrees, that means your sample is hydrophilic. Now you have heard of some methods that you can use for nanoparticle surface characterization. Now let's look at how we can characterize once we place those nanoparticles inside a biological fluid or um, let's say serum. Some of the methods we mentioned in nanoparticle surface characterization can also be used for nanoparticle serum interaction studies.
When the new particles are placed in a biological fluid, they start forming a, a protein layers, which is called protein corona. And it, the protein corona formation also depends on the physiochemical characteristic of your nanoparticles. And dynamic light scattering is one of the widely used techniques for the analysis of nanoparticle protein interactions, as well as surface func functionalization, aggregation, surface charge, shape, and size of your nanoparticles. So dynamic light scattering is a method that tells you about the hydrodynamic diameter of your nanoparticles. So, which means you have the your core bare nanoparticles surrounded by water shell. And when the DLS machine picks up, it picks up the particle with that water shell. So it's better to use TEM for the core size analysis and DLS for the particle size analysis inside um, water or, or um, let's say serum. But there are a few disadvantages of the DLS machine. So it's um, affected by the polydispersity of your nanoparticles. So what I mean by polydispersity is the size distribution of your nanoparticle. If there's a lot of um, aggregation in your sample, your the machine is likely to pick up more aggregates than the... So when you use a uh, DLS machine for the nanoparticle protein interactions, you need to do a few um, prior, um, processing. What I mean by that is you need to incubate your particles with serum, then you need to um, separate your serum uh, from your nanoparticle protein complex via centrifugation stages and then um, resuspend your nanoparticle protein complexes in water and then it will be read by the machine because machine won't be able to tell the difference between your nanoparticles and floating proteins because um, if it's within the size range of proteins you won't be able to tell the difference whether the machine picked up the proteins or it picked up um, your nanoparticles the ls machine also works um, by assuming that your particle is a sphere so if you if you put nano roots inside the ls it will uh, assume it's a sphere Differential centrifugal sedimentation, this year's machine has higher accuracy compared to DLS and many other methods. It's, uh, it can tell you about size, shape, aggregation, surface functionalization, or nanoparticle protein interactions. So firstly, you need to um, inject in a sac sacrose a gradient. So saccharose gradient amount depends on your particle density, type, etc. And once you have injected that uh, saccharose gradient, you then inject your sample into that chamber. And that chamber is a disc that uh, rotates. And as it rotates at a very high uh, centrifugation force, um, each end of that the uh, chamber has a detection the detectors so you'll see a um a curve coming up with peaks depending on the size and dispersity of your nanoparticles which then can tell you about um the size shape and aggregation of your nanoparticles it, it's a quite uh precise method you can you can even use this to uh, calculate your um, protein layer or even um, the length of your peg if you have pegulated your pug particles. For nanoparticle protein interactions, it's better method than DLS because you don't have to um, process your sample before putting inside that chamber so you don't need to apply higher centrifugation force to your 
samples to separate your serum, unattached serum from nanoparticle protein complex. Well, the process of um, separation of nanoparticles from this unattached serum is vigorous and it causes some unwanted aggregation and if you do DLS you'll you'll get um very polydispersed sample and it will be it will be shifted towards largest size so if you compare it to your actual core size of nanoparticles it will be quite different but DL uh, DCS is much better for analysis of your um, size analysis of your nanoparticles. So when nanoparticles encounter serum proteins, um, they form a new biological identity of particles. And we mentioned DLS and DCS for those interaction analysis and size analysis of that formed complex. But there are many other me methods you can use, which you can search um, on the internet. For example, nanoparticle tracking analysis, which can tell you about your concentration of your particles, aggregation profiles, serum interactions, and size of your nanoparticles. And there are other methods such as LCMS, which can tell you about the um, protein identity of, of your um, protein corona. Let's now look at the nanoparticle cell interactions and what techniques can be used to analyze this stage. So transmission electron microscopy is a um, widely used method to qualitatively um, visualize the cell uptake of nanoparticles. For TM analysis, you need to fix your samples, centrifuge them, form a palette, then process them into a resin, which then will be cut by a diamond knife into um, a thin layers around 70 nanometers in width, uh, which uh, then can be used for um, TM analysis. So you'll place that thin layer onto copper grid and read by TEM machine. Basically, it's just one cross-section through a cell, so it doesn't give you a wide um, picture of what's happening between nanoparticles and cells. TEM analysis is, is good for um, gold nanoparticles because it's gold nanoparticles are quite electron dense and you can visualize it on the TM, but some particles are not um, that electron dense and can't be visualized. So then if your particles are fluorescent, you can use a different technique, focal microscopy, um, to visualize the cell uptake. It's, it's, all, it's also a um, qualitative technique. It, it's, it's like um, going through a cell sections it won't give you a um, proper picture of what's happening. And also you can choose um, which cells you want to image. ICP can be used for um, elemental analysis of your nanoparticle as well as quantifying the cell uptake of your nanoparticles. So compared to TEM, it's a quantitative method and it gives you a whole picture of your um, of what's happening with your nanoparticles and cells. But this machine also has, da um, has downsides. So if you digest your um, digest your cells and it will give you a total uptake in in your whole sample. So for example, if you have a sample where nanoparticles are only attached to the surface of your cells and uh, some are inside of the cells, you won't be able to tell whether those um, 
nanoparticles were uptaken or were actually um, attached to the surface of your particle. So um, you will need to do prior processing. So you need to separate the membrane from the cytosol and then um, measure them separately using ICP machine to tell the difference. Thank you for listening and feel free to email me if you have more questions.